today, I want to just remind you that we've been going through, for those who may not have been here uh, for most of this year or new, uh, we've been going through uh, the book of Hebrews in a sermon series. And you say, well, today is Palm Sunday. Are we going to stay in Hebrews? But one of the amazing things about the scripture is that uh, God is able to weave together so many different stories uh, in a way that you don't need to deviate far from one page of scripture to not see the joy and the glory of Jesus Christ, especially this final week of his life that we mark by today. And so, yes, we are going to study Hebrews today, and yes, we're going to talk about Palm Sunday, and together, those two ideas are going to meld together. I pray that God will bless and encourage us and challenge us to, to live for him. So without uh, further ado, go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. And if you have your, your note page, uh, the note handout, uh, we will cover the notes today, but I will just let you know that since these were printed, uh, the notes were printed, God added some other things to my heart. So make sure you have space to write things on the side too, because I want to add other things. You say, how long ago did you print them? Uh, well, it was last night. But don't worry, God, God's always working on the sermon, even when I'm here talking. He's the one in control of it. And so uh, let's just very briefly pray uh, as we open the word that God will speak. Father, we thank you for the book of Hebrews. We thank you for all of scripture and your life and your sacrifice and your service and your love for us. Um, as, as Hebrews talks about that you are constantly speaking, as you speak today uh, through your written word, may we be listeners and hearers. And ultimately, as James says, may we be doers and change our lives. Uh, by what we hear here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Yeah, the, the book of Hebrews has been about the idea of Jesus speaking and how Jesus is indeed the living word. And it is, it's going to be woven throughout all of the book. Uh, and even, uh, I mean, just, just singing some of the songs today, I was reminded of near the end of the book of Hebrews, when we're talking about the blood of Jesus Christ, and we're going to celebrate that more uh, later this week, I was reminded of Hebrews chapter 12, uh, where it even, it, it, it wraps up, it's coming to the close of the sermon of Hebrews, and, and it reminds us that uh, in verse 22 of Hebrews 12, it says, you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable angels and festival gatherings, to the assembly of the firstborn who had rolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than that of Abel. You know, the, the idea that even the death of Jesus Christ, uh, in the very few words he was able to manage his broken body to speak out, his blood itself speaks a message to us. And it is this week as we think through that, that we worship and gather. But today, uh, we are not to Hebrews 12 yet. Uh, Lord willing, we will get there this year eventually. But we're in Hebrews chapter 3, and we've been talking about Jesus and God speaking specifically through Jesus and how Jesus is better uh, than everything around us uh, in our culture and how he's better than angels and how he's better than Moses there at the beginning of chapter 3. And we are now come to Hebrews 3, specifically 7 through 12 today, which in some of your Bibles, you'll see that most of that is a quotation. Once again, the author of Hebrews is going back to the Old Testament to, to make a quote of something uh, to teach a lesson. And he, he pulls here a quote from Psalm 95. Now, so it's Psalm 95 that this is from, and, and you can read there in Hebrews 3, 7, it says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, saying that God himself is the one who ordained the, the writing of Scripture, it says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Well, you're like, well, we're jumping right in the middle of a quote from Psalms, and, and the psalm is saying, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And they're like, well, what in the world was going on in Psalm 95 that we're getting this message? So let's go to Psalm 95, and you'll be amazed that you know really well the beginning of Psalm 95. I, I would imagine some of you have heard this before. Uh, some of you have even sung this before. Psalm 95 
and I'm reading from the ESV, says this. You, you, you know this part. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God and maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Wow, what's a great passage to celebrate and worship the fact that God, who made everything, he calls us his own. He, he, he says we are his sheep. Uh, we are cared for by him. Uh, we are the ones that he watches over. And often when we sing a song from here, we stop with that verse. We never finish Psalm 95. The song, and, I, and I've sung the Psalm 95 uh, from verses seven and uh, from verse seven, um, six and seven. That's great. But I've never had a song that finishes the rest of Psalm 95. But that is what is quoted for us in Hebrews three, where it says, "Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test." And put me to the proof. Though they've seen my work, for 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are people who go astray in their heart and have not known my ways. Therefore I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Wow. This is a psalm of very significant differences. We just got, he is our God, we're the people of his master, he takes care of us to... God loathed the generation and said they will not enter my rest. That's a very different swing in just four verses, right? So from people of this pasture to they don't get my rest. Why such a swing in Psalm 95? Well, the, the, the writer of Psalm 95 is trying to reach out and to challenge his generation with the idea that there is wonder and joy and glory in belonging to God, but because because of that, don't harden your hearts like our forefathers did. And so he's referring to a story that happened in the past and is writing in Psalm 95. The author of Hebrews then looks back at Psalm 95 to use that passage to teach his generation a lesson. And now what are we doing here today? We are here studying the book of Hebrews, looking back at that quote which is from Psalm 95, which refers back to the wilderness wanderings, and all of us here today are going to learn a lesson. You see that chain of events? And each time, someone goes back to the written word to challenge people to live today with the renewed sense. You say, all right, so what does that mean, and what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? Well, I'm glad you asked, because... Let us now think about this. So Psalm 95, we don't need to turn to it, is actually talking about initially something that happened in Exodus 17. And in Exodus 17, uh, they have not gotten to Mount Sinai yet. They haven't gotten the Ten Commandments at this point yet. Uh, they are in the wilderness, and they have just come through the Red Sea. They saw God move the water out of their way so that they could move through on dry land. And they watched as God destroyed their enemies. And that was amazing. And then they get into the wilderness. And they are disappointed that they are now out of food. And so God blesses them with bread from heaven. That they named manna. Which means what is it? And so now they've seen God move water out of their way. They watched God give them bread from heaven. And then in Exodus 17, they set up camp, and what do they do again? They complain that they don't have water. And because they don't have water, Moses cries out to God. They struck a rock, and water is provided. But at that point, Moses names that place Masa and Meribah. And Masa is like the Hebrew word for testing, and Meribah is sounds like the Hebrew word for arguing or complaining. So what Moses did is he named the place that they were at complaining and testing God. That's what he named the place. And so 
whenever they would go back to that place, where were you? Oh, I was at I was at arguing. Oh, you went to arguing. I remember what happened at arguing. You know, we we see Masa and Meribah it doesn't mean much to us, but for them, it's like Moses named it that they were complaining. They were arguing against God. But yet, this not this isn't just a quote or a reference to Exodus 17. It's also a reference to Numbers 14. And Numbers 14 is where the nation of Israel came up to the entrance of the Promised Land. They left Mount Sinai, and they went straight to the border of the Promised Land. It's only been uh, a few months since they left Egypt, and now they're at the border of the Promised Land, ready to go in. And they send in 12 spies, and the 12 spies come back, and 10 of them say, You know what? I know God moved the water and destroyed the whole Egyptian army. I know God gave us bread from heaven. I know God gave us water when there was no water. I know God appeared in a pillar of cloud and fire on the top of a mountain and spoke to us directly, then gave us his law. God did amazing things. But I'm not sure he can conquer these people I just saw. They had seen a lot of things, but the most recent thing they saw that morning was big scary armies. They said, we can't do it. And God said at that point that you cannot enter. And, and submitted them for 40 years of wandering the wilderness. And he told that generation, you cannot enter my rest. I had a place for you. I had something to give you. It would have been difficult. It was going to be hard. But I was going to make it happen. But because you didn't believe that I could take you through a difficult time, you don't get to enter what was on the other side of the difficulty. That's what the psalmist was writing about in Psalm 95, and that is what the author of Hebrews is writing about. Both of these stories, Exodus 17 and Numbers 14, are about people complaining just immediately after God has shown his power. They are arguing and complaining right after God showed them how great and amazing and powerful he was. And yet, they did not believe. And so that brings us to the story of Palm Sunday. And it's amazing that Palm Sunday, we, we, we mark it as this, in, in the beginning of Jesus' final week. And I encourage you to come back on Friday if you're not uh, participating, to really come and to enjoy the, the, the service, and then again on Sunday. But we, we begin this week with this story, and, and this story of Palm Sunday, as, as we've come to know it, is actually in every single gospel. There's not many stories that show up in all four. Uh, it's in Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, and John 12. And the basic details are pretty well established. You can go and read, uh, especially Matthew has a longer version about how God uh, sent some of his disciples in to get for him a, a, a donkey for him to ride on. And then as he entered, uh, the, the shouts and the praise. But I really want us to come to uh, John chapter 12. It's the, the addition. I'm glad it was what was read uh, this morning. That's the Holy Spirit again. Uh, it's the, the edition I want to, the version I want to look at today. Now, you have to remember that this is a holiday week at the time. It's the Passover week. And so Jerusalem is becoming to be filled with people. Uh, it's kind of like um, Kingston on the week of champs, right? Every hotel is booked. Um, the roads are full of people. This is Passover week. And so everybody's been gathering in Jerusalem. So there's a lot of extra people there. And these people are from all over Israel. Now, Jesus has traveled to a number of different places, but not everyone in Israel has been able to see Jesus in the past. But they have heard about him. And in John 12, verse 12, it says, The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming in Jerusalem. It says they, they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him. And, and this is why it's called Palm Sunday. They went out to meet him saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they, they are celebrating. And so Jesus sat on his donkey and he walks in and 
the authors of Scripture, both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all refer now back to another quote from the Old Testament. And this time it's from the book of Zechariah, where we're not going to Zechariah today. But it talked about how the king is going to come sitting on a donkey. And the fact of the matter is, though, the disciples only realized that, we find out here in John, later on, right? They knew the Old Testament, but when Jesus was actually there walking in on a donkey, they weren't really putting all the pieces together. And it tells us that in John, his disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, so after he left, then they remember that these things have been written. So after Jesus was gone, they're like, you know what? A lot of the Bible told us about Jesus. They remembered it later on. And it was from that that then they went out and they changed the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, what I think about here is the heart of the people on Palm Sunday. How is it similar to the heart of the people referenced in Hebrews 3, referring to, to Psalm 95. Well, in all of these cases, and, and I would encourage you to keep maybe one finger in John and one in Hebrews as we jump back and forth, that the problem in both cases is the heart. And you see in Hebrews 3, the heart shows up a number of times. In verse 8, quoting Psalms, says, don't harden your hearts as in the day of rebellion. And verse 10, God says they go astray in their heart. And verse 12, it says, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away. The problem is the, the heart. It, it's not always the, the expression, but it is from the heart that ultimately is what comes out. It is the heart that ends up overwhelming our actions, our desires, our words. Uh, we often sometimes, I don't know if you've ever said something, and then try to cover it up by saying I was joking or I wasn't serious. But you know where that phrase came from? It came from your heart. And the, the heart of the matter for both in Exodus, referenced in Hebrews, and in Palm Sunday, is this week was a test and a measure of people's hearts. And on Palm Sunday, people were glad, if you're following your notes, to accept the good but it requires greater belief to persevere in the heart. And with that being said, I just, I just want you to think about, we often just call this day Palm Sunday. And I appreciate the people who came out and, and, and decorated and added the palms and, and reminded of that. But one thing the, the chapter, the story in John doesn't really cover is a little fact that I want to draw your attention to that is recorded in the other places. In Matthew 21, it actually tells us that as Jesus was coming in in Matthew 21, verse 8, it says most of the crowd spread their, it says, cloaks on the road. And then others cut branches. Now let's stop and think about this for a second. How before the age of industrialization, especially if you read through the Old Testament, how important were articles of clothing? Well, they were very important because the entire process of making cloth and dyeing it and then sewing it was all done by hand. And it was a long process. That's why in the story of Rahab and the two spies in Jericho, it says she hid them in the flax on her roof. Well, flax is what the cloth was made out of, but you had to dry it, and that's why it was out on her roof. There was a long process. When Samson, in the book of Judges, was making bets with other people, you know what they gambled on? Clothing. In the Bible, it talks about that if someone asks you for your clothing, give them, give them an extra piece of clothing. And that was just unheard of, because you didn't have a lot of pieces of clothing. That's why when Jesus died, they took his what? His clothes. See, in Matthew, as Jesus was coming in, many of the disciples and the people who followed them, what did they do to cover the roadway for Jesus? They took off their own clothes and laid it in the dirt. 
You know what was on the road because of animals and other things traveling around? You know what was covering the dirt and all that? A lot of dirty, nasty stuff was on the road. But people were willing to take their clothes off and put that on the ground so Jesus could enter in a clean and glorified way. But what do we call this day? We don't call it Clothes Sunday, do we? Although Ruth recommended we do. We call it Palm Sunday. Now think about that. What did it cost some of these guys to run off to the side of the road and cut a palm branch down? It didn't cost them anything, right? Your car breaks down on Long Hill heading out to uh, the Good Friday service. What are you going to go get from the side of the road to put in front and behind your car? You cut a branch down and put it out there, right? Does it cost you anything? No. See, the palms were laid out by people who wanted to participate in this amazing thing that was happening, but they did not want to personally sacrifice their own clothing for the good of this man. They heard some stories. People were having a good time, and they were shouting and cheering. There's probably some really good music playing uh, on the speakers, and, and people were really excited. They wanted to participate, but they didn't quite want to really sacrifice. So what did they do? They went and chopped down some palms, and they put those on the road. They were contributing, but they were contributing at no cost to themselves. That's why I think it's funny that we call it Palm Sunday, we don't stop to think about the fact that the palms were representative of the people who were not willing to sacrifice. It's almost like when Moses named the place arguing or complaining. We're reminiscing about a thing related to people who like the idea of something, but not the cost of it. But that is what was happening here. Some people were there truly giving and worshiping and honoring Jesus. But there's a lot of people around who like the celebration, they like the worship, they like the, the ambiance, they like the vibe as it were, but they didn't want to give of their own belongings. They didn't want to give of their heart or their life. They had, what we're talking about here, a hard heart. The emotions were involved the, the, the physical participation was present, but they were not willing to, to take what cost them. They weren't willing to give of their own belongings. They weren't able to, to sacrifice and give for what was going on. And because of that, Palm Sunday is not the end of the story, but the beginning of the story. It's the triumphal entry, not the bloody exit when Jesus carried a cross and someone had to be made to help him carry the cross. See, the, the fact of the matter is is that following Jesus demands more than a show of worship. It requires commitment and sacrifice. And so that's why I want to finish back in John chapter 9. Or, sorry, John chapter 12. That, that story of the triumphal entry. It's really interesting how John 12 begins. It says, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. So he is on his way into Jerusalem. And what do we, we have happen here? Well, one of his, his female disciples, named Mary, came, and she took a, a large amount of perfume. Once again, something that was exceptionally priceless. And what did she do with it? She poured it all out on the feet of Jesus. And we watch as the disciples, especially Judas, getting upset over the waste of this money. But what was she doing? She was sacrificing for the sake of honoring Jesus. That is the example of giving all that she has for Jesus. The triumphal entry now comes, and in John, he only records for us the people who cut the branches of the palm trees, the people who did not sacrifice. And then it's interesting, as we follow the story of John, 
and, and the thing that's going, uh, coming at Jesus here for the rest of this week. Jesus, after this time, began to share the fact that something bad was coming. And then that happens in verses 27 uh, through 36. He, he talks about the fact that he is going to die. He talked about here, uh, and he said, when I'm lifted up, I will draw all people to myself, showing what kind of death he was going to die. But what happens is in verse 36 of John, after Jesus explains these things, he departed and he hid himself from the people. Now, just earlier, he has been walking in on a donkey, listening to thousands of people shout. He's listening to so much noise that the Pharisees are trying to tell uh, Jesus to have his followers be quiet. There's so much noise, and now Jesus removes himself. And I really want us to focus here, as, as we come to a close from John 12, verse 37, these verses, as though he had done so many signs before them, how does the verse end? They still did not believe. See, this is the hard heart that was reflected in Exodus 17, that was expressed in Numbers 14. It's the hard heart that the author of Hebrews is warning about. They have seen God here. They've seen Jesus do amazing things, but they do not believe. And, and, and the author here, John, says, because Isaiah even said this, that their heart is hard in verse 40. And in verse 41, I want you to look at these last three verses uh, of this paragraph. So it's John 12, 41, 42, and 43. So Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of them, meaning he saw the glory of God and spoke of them. But now in verse 42, nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him. All right, but what this means is that even the authorities here in Jerusalem on this week, as Jesus was coming in, many authorities believed in Jesus. They, they, they saw the power. They saw the things he was doing. They believed in him. But verse 42 finishes, but for the fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. Why? So that they would not be put out of the synagogue. What were they afraid of? They were afraid of being cut off from their culture, from their society, from the, the place that gave them meaning and value and belonging. They believed in Jesus, but they were afraid to say it. Because if they did, they would lose the life they had, the power they had, the prestige they have. And John 12, 43 gives us the key phrase here. For they love the glory of that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. See, Palm Sunday is a reflection of the glory that comes from man. At that point in time, Jesus, sitting on a donkey, is walking into Jerusalem to shouts of Hosanna, to shouts of you are the king, to people giving up their cloaks and throwing it on the excrement-covered road so that he can walk in and peace and glory and with perfection and honor. But at the same time, there's people who like the idea, cutting down palm branches so it doesn't toss anything, and throwing them on and gathering around and shouting in the midst of a crowd, but actually confessing in private or on their own or in a conversation, the people won't do it. They were scared of what it would cost them. And later on in the week, when the Pharisees get the upper hand, and they're parading Jesus, locked in, in chains, and beaten, and whipped, there's people all around who in their head, they believe in this Jesus. But at that point in time, they're not willing to step forward and walk next to Jesus. Even the twelve ran away. Why? Because they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. The triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, is, is a reminder that you and I are prone to desire the idea of Christianity. We love the idea of going to heaven. We love the idea of healing and, and the riches that come in Ephesians that talks about 
that we have everything that pertains to godliness. We have everything that God has given us, the glory and the wonder of the gospel and the death on the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, and it is wonderful to come here on a Sunday morning and to worship and to sing and to be overwhelmed with the, the, the emotions and the wonder of who Jesus is. We love the singing. But are we willing during the week to serve and to speak about this Jesus? There is people here on Palm Sunday who, because their hearts were hard, they participated when it was fun and easy, but they were not willing to really give up when it cost them. That is the essence of a hard heart. It, it is loving the singing, but not the service. It's wanting to be forgiven, but not willing to forgive. It, it's wanting to receive, but not wanting to, to give. It, it is this idea that, that as long as we are receiving and we are gathering and we are getting from church and the fellowship and, and, the, and the preaching and the teaching, as long as we're getting something, we're encouraged, our hearts are lifted up, we're refocused, we're, we're feeling good, and that is not a bad thing. But if that is all that we desire, then we are no different than the people laying palm branches down and not our cloaks. See, God calls us to be with him the full week, not just on Palm Sunday. He wants us there on Monday when he had to leave everybody because no one could really take what he was teaching. He, he wants us to be there with him in the garden when his disciples were weak and tired and could not just pray with him so he was alone. He wants us to be there with him when, when he's taken against, his, uh, against the, the will of the people in the darkness and taken to a fake trial and, and put before. But what happened to everybody? They abandoned him. Right now, it may be in your life it is easy to leave here and to go into your day-to-day -day life and to speak about Jesus. But I guarantee that there's times that you and me are sometimes ashamed to really say what we believe or to talk about Jesus or to go into a hard situation or, or to understand some of the hardness, the difficulties that we carry are, are not just something that we don't deserve, but it's something that we carry, a burden we carry so that we can reflect and serve our Jesus Christ. Palm Sunday is a reminder that we are prone, all of us, towards having a hard heart. And for us, the hard heart looks just the same as it did in Exodus 17. It looks just like in Numbers 14 and Psalm 95 and Hebrews 3 and John 12. It always comes back to the fact that we love the glory of man rather than the glory of God. The thing is, for you and for me, I, I don't know all of your stories. I don't know what you're going to be doing this week or next week. And, and so I can't tell you the specifics of what this looks like. But the fact of the matter is the same, is our hearts are no different than those people who forget so easily what God has done. And, and when we forget, we do in what happens in Hebrews 3, we go astray in our hearts. And that is because we are happy to do things when it's easy, but not when it's hard. So what does it mean when it, when it gets hard? Well, what it means is it is a a spouse or a family member who doesn't return the love that, that we give back. And so it's hard to just keep going. What it looks like is speaking about Jesus every day, even when people are tired of hearing about him. It's, it's when someone comes up and asks what you're going to be doing on Good Friday. You're going to the beach. It's like, well, no, I'm, I'm going to spend that day with my church. Well, why is that? Well, let me tell you all about my Jesus. Sometimes we don't have those conversations. We don't speak about those things. We're like those rulers who had power and authority, but the power and authority was given to them by man. 
And so they were afraid that if they, they spoke about Jesus, they would lose the power that they got from man. See, we are, we love the prestige that we get in life. We like the honor. We like the respect. We like the admiration of people for what we are doing. And, and it's easy to do that. It's easy to crave uh, achievement and success. We, we desire that. But the fact of the matter is, at some point it comes time to sacrifice yeah. and to give up our own desires, our own glory. For Jesus, that meant the man who was God, who could stop his persecution, willingly taking a beating, willingly taking mocking, false accusations, and none of it did he reach out and say, this isn't true. I don't deserve this. He knew that he served and pursued the glory of God. The author of Hebrews is challenging his people because they themselves are fearing that they're going to lose their culture and society. That's why the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than Moses. Jesus is better than these things. You have to understand that Jesus is better than success in this world. He's better than a nice house. He's better than a nice car. He's better than a good savings account in the bank. But we crave those things, right? We crave the safety, the security, the honor, and the glory that comes from a life that is well planned out, well thought out, and well structured to, to gain success without sacrifice. It's easy to grab a palm branch. Yeah. It's hard to give up our one piece of clothing. Yeah. It's hard to throw our life in the dung heap of the dirty road for Jesus. I grab a palm branch. It does the same thing, right? It covers the ground. It, it, it's no different, right? Those are the things we say to ourselves. I, I'm reading the Bible. I'm going to church. It's okay. I'm doing pretty good. But when it comes time to be difficult, when it comes time to be hard, that's when our heart is exposed. That's when the, the desires of our heart are made manifest. And that happens in little and big ways. Uh, I, I, I know I shared recently that um, at our kids' school there was a parent football match. And I remember sitting and watching uh, the, the field that, that we played on had a, quite a lot of rocks on it. And I remember watching as uh, the teams are playing, this is one time that I was watching, not playing, and I watched the goalkeeper. And, and a shot was made, and I, you could see it slow down as I watched the goalkeeper say, okay, is it important enough for me to, for, to stop this shot to dive down on those rocks and hurt myself? You know what he decided? It was not worth it. Let the goal go in, his legs were fine. And in the grand scheme of things, is a house football match at a school really worth it? Well, I don't know. But the fact of the matter is, is his choice was a measure of what is more worthwhile. Stopping that shot or preserving my body. And you say, well, that's a silly thing. But the fact of the matter is, those are the value judgments we make over and over and over again every single day. When we, when we uh, go, we, we do it with, with food. When we, when we go, it's like, oh, there's some uh, really nice cold juice there, or there's water. We have to make a value judgment. We, if, if we go somewhere where people are offering us a few different types of food, and then it's like, you can have this or this, what, what do we do? We make a value judgment. And that's easy and quick and doesn't really cost us anything. But this week, the world is going to throw at you value judgments where you have to decide whether you serve Jesus Christ or you serve the glory of man. And at that point, you are going to be asked, do you throw your cloak on the ground or do you go get a palm branch? I don't want to change the name of Palm Sunday or call it Clothes Sunday. 
Because I think it's good to name a day after something that challenges us to think differently. That's why Moses called the name of that place arguing and testing so that no one would ever forget that the heart of the matter is people had watched God control the ocean and they were worried about where they were going to get water. You know what they did? They complained. If you and I are sitting here today you say, well, what, what has God done recently? I haven't seen a wonder or a miracle or anything of that nature. Well, that's what's recorded in Scripture for us, and it is something we celebrate this week. We celebrate a man who came down to live entirely as a human being. He gave up access to his powers. Jesus Christ lived as a physical human being, and he knew as he approached this week and walked in on that donkey, the method by which he would die. We see that in John 12. I will be lifted up. He knew what crucifixion was going to cost him. But you know what he did? Without miracles, without signs, without wonders, as a human, he went in that week knowing his back was going to be ripped apart by shards of glass and metal. He knew that his head was going to be massive, just torn up by thorns being shoved on it. He knew that piercing his arms and his feet, going through his bones and his tendons into a piece of wood, so much so that it would agonize every time he lifted up to try to get a breath of air. He was going to do that without pure power or miracles or signs or wonders. He was an experienced yeah. crucifixion as a human. And you know what he did for you and me? He willingly took it. At any time he could have seized the power and delivered himself from that, but he didn't. We're not looking back at the moving of water. We're not looking back at the deliverance of water out of a rock. We're not looking back at the, the miracles of raising Lazarus from the dead, what we get to look back on is the fact of the matter that a man lived as one of us and willingly suffered exquisite, overwhelming physical agony with no hope of rescue, with no hope of being released from it, knowing that it would end in his physical, real death. Why did he do that? did it so that you and I could live a life free from the, the judgment and the glory of mankind. He did it so that we could be free to not listen to what the world says. He did it so that we could be free of the judgment or the honor that comes from man and we could be celebrate and, and look forward to the glory that comes from God that never goes away, that lives forever, if but we endure this life for a little while. That's why our theme verse is Hebrews 12. Looking unto Jesus, the author and completer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. And what does he say? Come to me. I am here ready to love you and to care for you, to satisfy you, but you have to resist the allure, the desire of the glory of man. John chapter 12, after the entry, we have these rulers, these powerful men, but in all of their power, all of their achievement, all of their success was so tenuous that they could not speak what was in their heart. Is your value, is your meaning, is, is who you are so tied up that if you speak about Jesus or you sacrifice for Jesus, it's all going to come crumbling down? If so, it's not a life worth having. It's not a life worth living. If everything can be lost by following Jesus, then it should be lost. It should be given up. Because Jesus Christ lived for us. He died for us. He wants us to have a soft heart that's willing to give up achievement, to give up success. He may not ask us to give it up, but be willing to. So that when he walks into our lives, when we lay our cloak down, or we go get a palm branch, 
As you walk out, you're going to walk past palm branches. I don't want you to look at them the same way. As you drive around, we live in a country, uh, growing up, Palm Sunday was always interesting because where I lived, there really weren't palm trees anywhere. And so, you know, as a kid, it's like, I, I know what a palm tree kind of looks like, but I don't, uh, I don't see one every day. You and I get to see one every day, right? I want you to never look at a palm tree without thinking about how easy it is to get a palm and to put it on the road. You see it all over the place. And then they fall down in our yards all the time, right? Imagine the cost it takes to use our cloaks. Let the palm branches remind us that it is not easy to follow Jesus. It is not the easy life that God calls us, but the life of sacrifice and service and a soft heart for him. But why? Because he did for us. I just want to wrap up by finishing reading that passage in Hebrews chapter 12 where it talks about that his, the blood of Jesus speaks a better word. I'm just going to read the last, the end of Hebrews chapter 12 and then I'm going to close in prayer. And it says this. I'll pick up in verse 24. To Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking today. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. And this phrase, once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made. It's all going to disappear in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Close your eyes and pray with me. Father.